This is Leave Your Mark. I'm Vince Cortez, and today's guest is Brad Lee. He is a husband to Melissa Ray, a father of two beautiful daughters, and an entrepreneur extraordinaire. He is the owner of a modern-day empire, both online and in the physical world. He's amassed 393,000 followers on his Instagram account, 168,000 followers on his Facebook page, and 111,000 subscribers on his official YouTube channel, Brad Lee, as of August 2021. He teaches world-class training systems that reduce turnover, increase customer satisfaction, and reduce the stress of the business owner. Brad, thank you for being my guest here today. Well, Vince, thank you for having me. Although your information sounds a little outdated, I still am happy. <laughs> Hi there, and welcome. Now it's time for America's, America's favorite, podcast. favorite podcast. Leave your mark with your host, Vince Cortez. If it's fly, loose fit it. It's Cortez. If freeze and shove is in it. It's Cortez. Leave your mark. It's about inspiring the world. One guess at a time. Pass the word from Brooklyn to Pittsburgh, from urban to suburb. It's Cortez, you heard? And here is our host, Vince Cortez. Well, I knew this was going to be good because you you are a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks on so many levels, my man. You are battle tested on just about every front this life has to offer. So I want to share with the audience a little bit about yourself, where you came from, what you did to get to where you are, and then, uh, you know, mix it up with you because uh, your podcast dropping bombs and your your programs of the, of the Lightspeed VT and all of this, we need to share with our audience. So uh, what I like to do is touch on, so you were born in Eugene, Oregon. And you're 1969, mom, Kim, dad, David, and you're one of five children. Uh, early life was a bit rough. You had a divorce from your parents and you were foster home for a short period of time. And then your father came and got you. So fill me in on when dad came back and what was life going to be like as far as finishing school and getting on with life? So how were you uh, when life began to take root in another direction for you? At two years old, you know, my parents got divorced and we ended up in a foster home to be orphaned out or, you know, adopted or whatever. Um, my grandmother who, who uh, told my dad, you better go get your kids or we got big issues. So my dad, you know, took responsibility and came and got us all. So I was two years old. I don't even really remember it. So it wasn't rough for me. I can't even remember it. And then we lived with my dad since then. So it wasn't really as rough as it sounds. No, you were, he was single parent? No, he, he had remarried uh, my stepmother. Her name was Becky. And he, uh, and again, Becky was there since I remember. So she, she must have been there when I got there. Okay, so now you're going, you're still in Oregon at this point, and you're heading into your teen years. What was life like um, heading into your teen years? Well, growing up, it was kind of children should be seen and not heard. And, you know, we were kind of provided for, meaning, you know, here's some food and here's some clothes, but we really weren't parented, you know, supervised, okay. we're gone a lot. So we kind of had to raise ourselves. So at about 16 years old, my dad decided to kick me out because I didn't mow the lawn like I said I would. So once he kicked me out of the house, uh, you know, I quit school, obviously, because why would I go to school? You know, I, I thought I knew everything. So I quit school at 16 years old, thought I was going to be a movie star, ran around trying to do all kinds of things, basically just became a little juvenile delinquent, little hustler lived, lived, uh, from, you know, on friends' couches here and there, you know, that's quite an experience in the in a window of our life where we're still really getting our sea legs. So at 16, your, your father asked you to leave the house and you sound like you just kind of marched right through, which is rather impressive for somebody that age and to go into a place like Los Angeles that cannot be uh, of the friendliest place you know, this is, this is a big step. So you're going out here and you decide to get uh, work. So you're, you're trying to be an actor and what, what came of that? I mean, well, uh, I got a starring role in a movie, but three days before production, the producer's son got out of a drug rehab and they gave him my part, but you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I got a few parts here and there, but I just got tired of being broke. I 
essentially, and uh, decided to, you know, go get rich first. Uh, when that guy got the part, my part, I was explained to the, the producer, the one paying for the movie gets to make the decisions. And so that's unfortunately what happened. So I thought, well, well, then I got to be the one paying for the movie. So I'm the boss. So I said, hold on, I'll be back to this acting thing. I'm going to go get rich real quick and I'll come right back and then produce the movie myself. Um, I just didn't know it'd take this long. So I never I never did go back, but I'm not done yet, believe it or not. I will I will in the next couple of years probably make a movie or two and see if I got the the bug still. Okay. Well, I mean, if it's there, it's there. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Be our friend on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You are listening to listening to Vince Cortez. We just want you to leave your mark. So your idea of making money is spawn. So you uh, get into sales because sales is where the cash is at. And it sounds like you started selling everything and did flourish selling cars. So what happens as you get into developing your, your skill set out in the real world? Well, at six years old, I was given a box of candy bars to go sell. Um, and I went home and my brothers ate half of them. And, you know, my, we were from a blue collar, so nobody really bought any. So I went door to door. And as soon as I went to three or four doors, I developed a, a presentation or a pitch, if you will, where when they knocked on the door, I'd put the candy bars behind my back. And when they answered, I'd say, do you have the phone number to a good roof repairman? And they'd say like, you know, what's that got to do with anything? And I say, because when you taste one of these, you're going to go through your roof. And people just started buying them all. So I realized very young age that I had a little gift of selling because I outsold everybody and sold more candy bars in the history of the world than anyone's ever heard of. And I didn't realize at the time that that was kind of a gift I just, you know, had success. So when I was 17, maybe, yeah, 17 and a half, I was told to get a real job. Um, all my family and friends were kind of pressured me because, because I didn't really work. I just hustled. Like I would go to the mall and find, allegedly go to the mall and find receipts on the floor and then go figure out what they purchased and then return it for the money. So I was just like hustling, you know? And so everyone told me to get a real job and I got this job fighting forest fires, or at least I thought. And when I showed up, man, it was just a terrible job. They had me packing around water, squirting on stumps. It wasn't glamorous at all. I got poison oak, told them I couldn't come in because I had poison oak. And they basically said, that's part of the job. You're going to get it all over you and you're going to continue to have it. So you might as well get used to it. So I quit. And then I opened up the newspaper the next day and saw a job selling cars. So I went in and applied and started selling cars. And that's really where the sales career took off. Now you come across, you do incredibly well selling the cars and somewhere along the line, you realize that it sounded like that strategy when you were selling those candy bars door to door comes into play. You realize that creating a system or a strategy and using technology incorporated with that, and you have yourself a software that's a private label that you get very formidable with, and you start meeting some high power people. So share with me, what was the idea to start that software? And then where did it initially head to? Well, from 18 to 30, I just kind of stayed selling things, art, RVs, all kinds of things, car business, um, but at 30 years old, I was running a car dealership and I helped this guy in the back, uh, that was minimum wage and it felt like good showing a guy that was minimum wage, how to make money. So I thought to myself, man, I've got the ability to help people make money. Why don't I just start a training company and, and quit my job and go out and start training people on how to sell and close and persuade. So I quit my job. I went out and started that training company and very quickly I realized that I wasn't as effective as I should be. And it wasn't working as well as it used to when I worked at the dealership and I couldn't figure out why. So I kind of did a little comparison to see what's changed. And ultimately I found that there's four key ingredients to training people. It's good content, repetition, practice, and accountability. So out on the road, I wasn't delivering all those because I was just there for a day collected my 10 grand training and leaving. So I realized I had to have something different if I wanted to stay in business. So I, the internet was just coming out. So I thought, man, I should put this training on the internet 
so people can access it 24 seven, they can get the repetition. So that's when I created Lightspeed to facilitate uh, my training and make sure that it works. And then it started to work pretty well, but then I ran into competition. And then instead of competing with those guys, I decided just to collaborate with those guys. And I sold them my software, private labeled it for them, and then helped them sell the rest of the dealerships that I couldn't sell because my, you know, my name, my brand wasn't big enough back then. So that's how I started closing and doing business with all the big name trainers is I, I sold them my software to use because they didn't have it and they were doing it the old fashioned way. So I, I literally just closed all of the big name trainers. And what year was that? That was, I mean, I started the company in 99. So I would say, you know, I started selling dealerships right away, but um, I would say 2002 took a couple of years to kind of get beat up and figure out that, Hey, it's going to be easier to collaborate than compete. So around 2002, I started closing these trainers and and then I, that's when I kind of shifted to just the technology. I quit trying to be a trainer. Okay. So you cross paths with uh, Grant Cardone and I, I definitely you know, cross paths with him and um, he uses your program. He still uses my program. Yes, and sir. And so what attracted somebody of his mindset to what you were doing? And then how did he get involved? Yeah, I attracted him. I hunted him down and closed him. I like to tell people, I close the guy that teaches you to close. I'm the guy that closes the guy that teaches you to close. But no, I mean, I I had I had companies that I was trying to sell my training to that they would say, well, we use this person or this person or this person. And every time they named somebody, I went and closed them. So I went to a car dealership and they said, well, we use Grant Cardone. And I'm like, well, I'll just go get Grant Cardone then. So I went and closed Grant Cardone on using the platform. Then I'd go back to the dealership or tell Grant about it and say, hey, you know, they wanted your training on this platform, but it didn't exist. So I closed Grant and then he started selling all the dealerships I couldn't. And then all the other names people would come up with, Joe Verde, Alan Ram, Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, Tom Hopkins, um, uh, Joe Girard. Like there was a bunch of them back in the day. Tom Stuker. I just closed them all. So now they were all using my my technology. So I was kind of their back end partner. Now you put in the technology in front of them. This is interchangeable to the different types of jobs or and uh, niches that these people are in. Yeah, I mean, all you need to train someone is good content, repetition, practice, and accountability. So if you're training somebody on how to, you know, change tires or how to sell or how to run the cash register, the, the technology delivered, tracked, and measured good content with repetition, practice, and accountability. So it didn't matter what kind of training it was, the system facilitated it. If you are listening from Australia, Florida, or just from around the corner. From East Coast to West Coast outlets, if you're not to the dirty South straight, make a left and body Contact us. Leave your mark with your host, Vince Cortez. Okay, so then this is interesting because a lot of that techniques inside of selling, because we're selling to the same uh, a human being on the other side. At what point in your strategy and what you're doing, do you realize that the repetition of you're talking to a human and you know how they, they want to be treated like you want to be treated? So this probably hit a point for you where it got really easy and the internet making it available is, is easy as well. Um, you begin to, to go big here. I mean, from like 2008 to 2019, you're just, you're going like great guns. So what are the methods that you think besides the four combinations, the four keys, it was the key to this success where you are now? Well, number one, it's never been easy and it's still not. So if people are thinking it's going to get easier, I don't think it gets easier. I think you just get better. Okay. So, so. To answer your question, I mean, what was it? It was it was a combination of things. There's not one thing. You know, there's timing, number one. You know, there's persistence, number two. There's confidence, number three. There's skill set, number four. There's, there's uh, you know, discipline. I mean, it, there's a combination of things that most successful people have. And if you go back and look at all of their stories, they're all going to be in those like again success has a recipe 
unfortunately, most people forget a few ingredients and then they never, they wonder why they never make it. What I want to ask you is, is what do you do in your routine that makes you better at what you're doing? How are you fine tuning your skill? Well, every day I, you know, learn and seek new information. I, I, I'm into personal growth and development. I realize that if you want to get something different, you have to do something different. So in order to do something different, you have to literally change your beliefs because the reason you do what you do is because you believe what you believe. So in order to change your beliefs, you just need new information. So I seek new information on a regular basis. Like every day I'm reading 10, 20, 30 pages of a book, listening to a podcast, listening to an audio book, doing whatever I can to get new information. And then that new information, you know, changes my beliefs and my beliefs constantly, you know, change my mindset, my skill set, and my habits are all I have to focus on to make sure I'm a success. What is your favorite part about what it is you do? My favorite part is the ability to get the knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. Cause I believe people are failing because they don't know what to do. They don't have the right information, you know? And, and the best part of it is I bring that knowledge to the people who need it. So I'm watching people transform on a regular basis and, and I'm somewhat responsible. So again, I like it. <laughs> Where do you see yourself in five years from now? Probably just a billionaire. Um, helping people achieve their dreams since I already achieved mine. So you're, you're ready to give back. Well, I mean, I want to thank you for your time because I know you're very busy. And as I ask all my guests when they come on the show, how would you like to leave your mark? Well, man, I just, again, I, I hope people understand one thing when it boils down to it. They're worth more than they believe. So I hope I leave my mark by demonstrating that, Things are possible um, and that anyone can can succeed. So people have a better self-worth because if you want to increase your net worth, you just increase your self-worth. I want people to feel better about themselves, like themselves more. I want to be known as the guy who brought the information that changed lives. Like it, like it, Brad. Now, I have to tell you, I enjoy watching you and your podcast. Uh, I probably see more of what you do on Instagram. And um, the temptation for myself to make it a little bit looser conversation. And I knew I had limited time because I, I enjoy your personality. I, I think that your approach is very straightforward. And the idea that some folks can't handle it on that level and others love it. And I have to tell you, I personally love it. And I was most grateful for you to come on a show today. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, I just feel that the truth is easier to understand, not always as digestible, meaning people do sometimes get offended when they hear the truth. But dude, listen, love ain't lies. Okay. Love ain't lies. You want a bunch of people lying to you? Well, then you're an idiot. Okay. You want the truth. You, you may not like it, but you want the truth. Trust me. And I, and I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that will bring it. You know, I just want to, I, I just tell the truth and I, and I try to, you know, not beat around the bush and I try to be, I, I'm empathetic when it comes to t telling people things, but like, why try to use $10 words when you can just say it more plainly? The truth isn't difficult. And I think as you said it very well there, it's like, it provides all the answers. Even if there's pain, the answer is in the truth. So that that's the way to go. I really, you, your story is tremendous. I mean, you're completely self-built. Not true. I don't think there's anyone that's self-made in this entire world. Somebody had to buy my stuff. Somebody had to say yes. Someone had to agree. Um, and I don't believe in self-made, but I definitely believe that I came from nothing. That's for sure. That is for sure. I mean, that is a true testament to your will. And yeah, but you know, if you think about it, man, whether you're born into money or not is not your is not under your control, you know. But how you live life is. So if you come from a poor family, that's okay. Just don't die in one. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Brad. You're welcome, bro. Appreciate you. 
Thanks for listening to Leave Your Mark today. Tune into our next episode of Leave Your Mark with Vince Cortez. Be blessed. You just left your mark. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Listen to more episodes on demand. Just click Leave Your Mark with Vince Cortez.